Awesome, we've already got some attendees joining. Welcome, welcome. We're gonna give everyone a few moments before we get kicked off here. And thank you everyone to everyone for, for joining. We still have some people rolling in. So we'll get started about five after just to give everyone a moment to join. Um, but thank you, regardless of which time zone you're in right now for, for joining us this, um, this morning, this afternoon. Um, yes, we just got a question through around the recording or slides be made available. Will they be made available to attendees? Um, we will make, uh, we, we will be making these available after the presentation. So uh, no worries on frantically taking notes throughout this time. Okay, I think we've got most of our um, attendees on the line actually. And I know we have a lot of content, we're eager to jump in. So we can go ahead and get started. So thank you to everyone who has joined our NLP Sandbox webinar. Our team has been really hard at work these last couple of months um, doing off all the doing all the, the last uh, fit and finish on everything here. And we launched most recently a couple weeks ago. And this webinar is to kind of give an introduction to the service, um, give you a sense of our vision and also introduce you to the team. Everyone that's got their cameras on right now um, has been a part of the project, either on the data side or the tool development. And we're really excited to just share what we have with you today. Um, before I hand it over to Tomas to launch us into an overview of NLP Sandbox, I wanted to give everyone a heads up that you are being recorded right now. And if you have any questions to direct them, not to the chat box, but the Q&A, that way we can moderate more quickly. Um, we'll try to answer them during the time, but anything we don't get answered during the chat, we will hold for the end during the Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Tomas where he's gonna impress us with a lot of um, information about NLP Sandbox and a few demos. And yeah, any questions, please direct them to the Q&A. Thanks for joining again. So good morning, everyone. So my name is, is Thomas, and I'm going to give you an overview this morning of the, of the NLP Sandbox. So here is the agenda for the presentation. So first, I'm going to introduce Sage Bionetworks, who was leading the, this project. Also, what, what is our vision uh, for the NLP Sandbox? Then I will introduce the first series of benchmarks uh, that are currently supported, which are about PHI annotation and the identification task. I will then describe the, the NLP Sandbox API that we have built. And then I will give a demonstration on how to, with just a handful of commands, create uh, an NLP Sandbox tool. And then I will dive into a bit more detail about the, the benchmarking infrastructure, then give a second demonstration that illustrates uh, one of the properties of the, of the NLP Sandbox tool. 
which are that uh, we design them to be reusable. And then we will end with a, a conclusion and then answering a question live. So Sage Bionetwork is a nonprofit uh, organization based in Seattle. Our mission is to accelerate biomedical discoveries by improving methods for scientific collaboration and communications. So here is a slide that uh, I like to include uh, at the beginning of uh, several of my presentation. So here you can see the, the core value of, the, of Sage. I'm not going to, to go through all of them, just give you a few seconds to, to read these few bullet points. Um, but yeah, if I, if I want to highlight one of them, or so for example, the last one, do trustworthy, impactful work and uh, prioritize the, the outcome of a regular actor, maybe, and be bold and willing to experiment. So, which is one of the things I really love about this NLP Sandbox project is the ability that all of us had to um, learn new technology and also um, put it uh, to use uh, the experiments we have accumulated uh, in the space of challenges over the past years. So to start with, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction about what is a, a scientific challenge. And that's one domain, where, one domain where Sage is very active for now more than 10 years. Um, this is often, often these challenges they are organized in, in collaboration with a, a challenge organization called Dream. And so here I'm showing an example of um, the top of a homepage that uh, of, of a challenge we have organized in the past. So during a, a scientific challenge, we invite a community to address a specific question of interest. And so this challenge would introduce a question, describe the input data available, the, the output data. Um, often there may be more than one question to answer. And then by definition, a, a challenge is usually, usually has a fixed timeline. So here, for example, you can see at the bottom uh, that the challenge can last over uh, two to three months in general. And it's also decomposed into, into several phases. And so during the active phase of the, uh, of the, of the challenge, participants build models submitted for evaluation. And then in the last, in the last two, three weeks, um, participants are asked to select the best model they have developed so far and then submit it. Uh, and this model is going to be evaluated on a data set which has not seen before. And the performance of this model uh, will be used to build the final leaderboard and, and rank the, the submission, which is what you can see here, an example of, of leaderboard where you have the name of the model. We also provide information on who submitted the model and uh, the value of different performance metrics. So, so we are using different uh, challenge formats. So one of them, which we call the traditional challenge format or data to model format is challenges where basically organizers provide participants with a training data set, which the participant can then use to train their model. And then the organizer also provide a validation data set that the, the participant also uh, use to, uh, and, and they run locally their model on this data set. And then the participant generate a prediction file. This prediction file is then sent to the challenge organizer who compares them to the ground truth um, in order to score the, the submission and generate the, the leaderboard table. Over the past five years, we have been quite active into developing uh, new technologies that allow us actually to evaluate model on private and sensitive data that cannot be shared with, uh, with a participant. So here in this challenge format, which we called model to data challenges, participants are asked to build their tool, um, either using public data set or private data set, which is available to, to them maybe through their organization, and then containerize their algorithms. And then we ask participants to submit their portable tool or model to uh, our benchmarking infrastructure. And then depending on the challenges and depending on the availability of a training data set, we may first run this submission on a private training data set. Um, the output will be a trained model. 
And this trained model is then used using a, a second script provided by the participant, which then which is then applied to a validation data set in order to generate prediction. And then these predictions are being scored. And once again, they are, uh, the results are published in a, in, a, in a leaderboard table. I'm going to dive more into the, the model to data uh, framework over the, the course of this presentation. So yeah, I mentioned that Sage is, is quite active in the, in the field of uh, scientific benchmarking. Here are three challenges that I organized. And um, next to it, what, what are the lessons that, that we learned from them? Or what, what is the technology that we developed? So the first challenge that I helped organizing is the Digital Mammography Dream Challenge, which was organizing in 2015. And in this challenge, we had access to uh, a huge data set, 14 terabytes of mammogram images. Each of these images are, are very heavy around like uh, I think 30 megabytes each. So we had thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of these mammogram images. And since we were not able to share this data with the participant, we built a benchmarking platform uh, using the model to data paradigm. And that's the first time we, we, we put in place this strategy and, and we use Docker uh, uh, in order to, Docker is a, is a containerization technology. So participants dockerized their tool and then were able to send uh, the tool to us so that we could evaluate in a, in a private and, and secure environment behind a firewall. The second challenge that I helped organizing was in 2019, actually shortly after I, I joined Sage, uh, which is a patient mortality prediction challenge. And in this challenge, uh, that's the first time we, uh, we used basically EHR data. And the goal of the challenge was to predict, uh, you know, given all the electronic health record of a, of a patient, predict the, whether the patient is going to pass away within the, the next six months. Um, so here, because of the, here again, because of the sensitive nature of the, of the data set, uh, we, we, we continue exploring, uh, you know, uh, model to data technology, also trying to make it smoother for, for challenge participants to, to use. And then in 2020, we actually organized our first, uh, what we call the benchmark. So the difference between a benchmark and a challenge is that while a challenge is usually fixed in time, a benchmark is meant to be open and has no end date. So the COVID-19 EHR challenge, I think, has been running now for almost more than a, more than a year. And this enabled, for example, you know, participants who were busy at the time of a, of a challenge and we were not able to, to participate. In the case of a benchmark, um, they, they can. And we are also moving towards a format where uh, first, uh, an event can be organized as a challenge and there is incentives behind it uh, that motivates people to focus to work kind of hard during uh, maybe two to three months, but then the challenge uh, would be converted to, to a, a benchmark so that anyone later can submit their own tool and compare them uh, with the performance of other tools. So why did we develop this NLP sandbox? So, so as it has been shown in the past, so healthcare uh, AI has really the potential to transform healthcare for, for the better, but there are a lot of barriers. Um, one is, is about ensuring that the, uh, that the data, that the quality of the data is good enough to correctly assess the, the performance of the tools. One is getting access to this sensitive information that usually stays on the sites of their, the, the, comp, the organizations that own them, for example, hospitals or healthcare institutes. And another one is a, a current leg of a, of, a, of a framework to assess whether the, the performance of the tool and also whether the performance of a tool generalized to multiple data sets. Um, something that we have also observed over the past is that the tools that are submitted to challenges, they would not be mature enough you know, uh, to be deployed in a production environment. They would not be uh, robust enough and, and then they may break as soon as data different from the challenge data uh, is inputted. And given the experience of Sage in the, in the space of scientific challenges, uh, we were very excited to, to tackle these different um, challenges, if you want. So 
here's a is a team behind the, the NLP sandbox. Um, this is a, a multidisciplinary team with software engineer and NLP software uh, advisors. We also come from several organizations. Uh, several of us come from Sage Bio Network, but we have also George from MCW and, and CGA from, from Mayo Clinic. And Connor, who previously was an intern at Sage, but he's now back to, uh, to UW. We also have several partner organizations such as C CD2H or NCAT or, or ITCR who are funding this project. And then we have also data partners who uh, work with, uh, with us in order uh, for them to deploy the, the benchmarking infrastructure that we provide so that when a, a developer makes a submission, then the, the submission is uh, being evaluated on data that leave it. Um, a different physical location. And these data partner include MCW, who is now fully onboarded. And right now we are working on onboarding Mayo Clinic and the, the University of Washington. So our first vision for the NLP Sandbox is to build a, a distributed ecosystem for the unbiased assessment of NLP tools using clinical data. Our vision here is really uh, to enable researchers to build their model and then easily submit it to the benchmarking platform. And then the, the submitted tool would be shipped automatically to several data sites. The, the tool will be processed against the, the private data of each site. Um, prediction will be generated. This prediction will be scored. And then ultimately the score is returned back to uh, the NLP sandbox where we gather them and then we show them in a, in a leaderboard table. Our second vision is to try to bridge the gap between developers who um, develop their tool and then benchmark it, and then try to bring this very same tool that have been benchmarked on our platform to make them so that they can be deployed in a production environment. And really one of the goal of this project and the way we design our API and you know, what are the properties that we want the, the tools to have is to accelerate the translation of tools uh, for improving patient care. So the first series of benchmark that we are supporting in the NLP sandbox is about uh, our PHI annotation and the identification task. I think that's a task that is applied in all hospitals, all healthcare institutes. And here, one of the most typical use cases is a hospital want to identify clinical notes so that these notes can then be shared with external collaborators. So in order to achieve that, you would apply uh, most of the time uh, NLP method or natural language processing tool that takes as input the raw clinical note and then output the clinical note where the location of the sensitive information has been uh, detected. And then this information can be anonymized before sharing the, the uh, note with the uh, external collaborators. So while this is the initial task that we want to support, that we support in the NLP sandbox, we really designed the sandbox so that it can be used to benchmark any types of NLP task. One of them is the identification of COVID symptoms, and that's a task organized by Mayo Clinic, and we plan to launch it uh, within a couple of weeks. But other tasks may include you know, the annotation of obesity status or medication intake or other type of task. Not only limited to annotation, but also, for example, building knowledge graph using information such as clinical note, patient uh, record, patient objects, etc. So before even st starting the implementation of the of the NLP sandbox, the first thing that we did was to identify the three stakeholders and and their use case, and. We really wanted to design the platform so that it's a place where we can connect these three stakeholders. So these, these stakeholders are the, NL, the developers of NLP tools, the users of, of NLP tools, and partner organization who help the project by um, providing data. 
So in the case of an NLP developer, so the, the developer is interested to, to go to the NLP sandbox to find documentation first on how to package his or her tool so that it can be submitted for, for evaluation and then be able to easily submit the tool to the NLP sandbox and then visit leaderboard table to see how well this tool performed compared to other tools. From the point of view of a data provider, so the data provider want to support the, the community by deploying the, the benchmarking infrastructure that we provide in, a, in their very secure environment behind firewall. And so once the, the benchmark infrastructure is deployed, they will be listening to submission queue, pull submission as they arrive, evaluate the submission against their own data set, score the, submission, score the submission, and then publish the results in, in leaderboard tables. And also the partner organization want to be able to find onboarding documents and SOPs on the NLP sandbox, which we are also providing. And finally, the, the users of the NLP tools, they are interested in going to uh, a one-stop shop where they can easily identify the, the best performing tools for the tasks that they want to, to perform. So we enable this through leaderboard stable. So the user goes, can easily identify the best performing method for a specific task, and then deploy it in their production environment. Now, one incentive for users to also be data partner is that if um, tools submitted are systematically evaluated on a sample of the organization data, then this makes the task uh, of the organization to identify the tool easier because then they can see the performance of the tool on a sample of their own data instead of um, data from other organization. So here I'm introducing the, the 2014 I2B2 challenges, uh, the identification challenge. Um, this also gave, gave rise to um, a PH, the PHI annotation standards that most organizations are now following in order to annotate PHI information in clinical notes. So in this challenge, what the organizer did was to, to uh, get access to a set of clinical notes and here you have an example for, of one of them where in red you have PHI information highlighted. This include information such as date, person, uh, or, or different identifiers. And then the organizer used either manual or semi-automatic way to annotate these clinical notes and, he, and, and generate a gold standard where you can see here for, um, that this clinical note has a, a date Annotate uh, as a date string, you know, at character 16 uh, until character 26. And this sensitive information is of type date. And so what the organizer then did was to, to anonymize the information be, uh, from in the clinical note so that patient cannot be re-identified from the anonymized clinical note. And this, then this, get, this led to the creation of a shareable data set that the organizer shared with the participant. So the participant got access to a training data set, an evaluation data set. And we are really in the configuration here of the, of the data to model approach I, I mentioned earlier. Um, often, um, so even though the challenge is called the identification challenge, it's important to note that actually the identification is composed of two different operations. The first operation is uh, the detection or annotation of sensitive information. And then once we know where in the clinical node the, the sensitive information is located, then we can apply an anonymization uh, method to get the identified clinical nodes. And in this context, what we are currently benchmarking in the NLP sandbox is the ability to annotate PHI information. So I mentioned that Sage has a lot of experience into organizing scientific challenges. Here you have an example of the tool specifications that we gave to the participant in the, in the digital mammography challenge. And this reflects, uh, this is basically how we do it in most past challenges. So here you can say that we ask participant 
to build their tool so that it's generating a prediction file at a specific location using this, this specific format. And then there is a, a, a few more uh, specifications that we provide and hope that uh, participants read carefully and, and implement all these, these specifications. Here you have similar specifications that were given for uh, uh, to another challenge. Now, one of the issues is that if you are not careful, so you may have heard about this story where, um, I don't know if you played with gene names in the past, but if you were to input them in a spreadsheet and most uh, primarily uh, an Excel spreadsheet, then Excel would basically think that you are inputting a date and then it will modify the, the value of the cells. So here it's just to highlight that um, in a challenge, so when we provide data to, to participants in the model to data framework, um, participants use parser to, to read this data, but if they are not careful, their tool can very easily break, just maybe because during the challenge, the ID were a uh, string, but suddenly, you know, after the challenge, someone is interested in reusing the best performing tool, and then the tool is applied on a new data set where, you know, maybe the, the ID is still a string, but it's actually numbers, and so the parser may automatically try to be smart and interpret this colon as being inte integer, which may then break the, the tool and, and cannot really be used uh, in, in this case. So um, before answering, before giving you the, the solution that we came up to, to this problem, so here are a few properties that we want the NLP sandbox tool to have. So the, the standard is called, is based on the FAIR standard, which is um, kind of now has been around for quite some time, but so FAIR stands for the tool should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and reusable. Now, in addition of these four properties, um, three others are being listed here, which are often mentioned in, in CD2H project. And one of them is traceability. So the, the, the tool documentation should inform on the tool provenance and also uh, attribution. The tool should be licensed as well. Uh, it should be easy to access the license of the, of the different dependencies of the tool. And before deploying a tool, Ideally, the user should be able to identify what are the other components that need to be, to be installed. So the approach that we adopted was to, to use OpenAPI, which is a, a, a standard for, for uh, writing the, the specification of API services. So here on the right, you can see an example of the OpenAPI specifications that we provide for one of the tools that we support, which is a, a data annotator. So this specification provides in a very, in a, in a structured way, information about the version of the, of the specification, the title of the tool, different information about the, the license of the tool. And then this specification says that the tool must implement four different functions. Um, and, and also describe what is the schema of the input and the, the schema of the, of the output. Um, one of the first benefits of having this structured specification for our tool is that then there is a way to automate a lot of things. And one of the first benefits is the automatization of the generation of, of documentation. And so here you have an example of, of documentation page. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quickly an example of, of, of such pages. Uh, but in addition of automatically generating documentation for developers, uh, one of the beauties is that we are using a tool called OpenAPI Generator that takes as input uh, an, a, a tool specification that we provide. We, we provide them in, in JSON and YAML format. So the OpenAPI Generator can read uh, both of these formats. And then the OpenAPI Generator can be used with a single command to automatically generate what we call a, a tool stub, or here in the case of the data notator, uh, a, a data notator stub. And it's, it's basically a tool that you can uh, run and that you can run and, and play with. Uh, it just doesn't do anything interesting because it doesn't know how to do 
the, the task at hand. And so then the, 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 the next task of the developer is to, to implement this, for, for example, in this case, the four function I, I highlighted before. And one of the specification of the NLP sandbox is that we didn't want to lock developer to a specific programming language or framework. And so the open API generator can be used to generate stubs for more than 50 different programming uh, language and, and framework. And in the case of the data annotator, we provide two examples, one in Python and one in Java. And, for, and in general, for all the examples we provide, we provide at least one implementation in, in Python. So here I'm going to give a, a demonstration on how to develop such tools. So first, uh, the developer would go to nlpsandbox.io um, to find uh, information about the different tasks that are available. So right now, we support a series of tasks about PHI annotation and the identification. And then for each task, we provide a link to the OpenAPI specification. Uh, we also provide a link to the, to the leaderboard table and then example tools, as well as technical information, uh, like what are the compute resources that the tool has access to, how many submissions the team can make per day, etc. cetera. Um, one of the benefits actually I can mention is that um, before starting to implement a tool, one of the benefits of the NLP sandbox is that the, the developer or prospective developer can look at the different leaderboard table and then look at the performance of the tool. And let's imagine that the, the data notation leaderboard has many, many tools that achieve a near perfect performance. And then maybe this developer will say, okay, it's not maybe where my time can be the most widely used. And so I would look at another task and then see, oh, actually there's still, if there's still room of improvement for personal name annotation. So I'm going to focus my, my work on this task. So once the developer has identified the tool, uh, he's in, he or she is interested in, in deploying, um, the developer can access the, the specification. So this is a documentation I mentioned before um, that has been automatically generated from our open API specification. And here you can see the different functions that this tool should should implement or must implement. So one of these functions is, for example, we expect the participant to, so this function takes nothing as input and the output should be uh, an object that provide information about the tool, such as the name of the tool, the version, the, the license under which the, the tool is released, as well as other information to, to contact the author or, or cite the, the tool. So given this open API specification, um, which you can download here, so this would basically download a, a JSON file, um, then the developer can very quickly generate this, this uh, tool stub I mentioned before. So for example, in this case, what we are going to do first, so here I'm in a folder, which is empty. And then I'm going to create a countdown environment just to isolate the, the development of this tool. And then I'm going to activate this countdown environment. So the, 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 the folder is still empty. And then using a single command, I'm going to run the open API generator. I'm going to specify that I want a tool um, in Py using Python Flask. And here you can find different values that you can specify here if you go to the website of the open API generator. And then here is a link to the specification of the data annotator. We also provide the, the specification for other tools such as person name annotator, um, ID annotator, etc., and even a PHI annotator that includes all these individual annotator. And here you can also change which version of the tool you, you want to, to implement. Here I'm just going to go for the latest version of the specification. So here's the open API generator don't automatically downloaded the specification and then generated the, the tool stub. So here you can see several files have been created. Um, so all these files have been automatically generated. And here under model, so you can see 
all these models, for example, you know, the clinical note has an identifier, a text property. All this has been automatically generated. There is also uh, validation that is performed based on the, the uh, constraints that we have set in the in the specification of the tool. So that if you create to if you try to create a note object that has, for example, an identifier longer than 60 characters, then your code is going to, to show you an error. So this is really towards you know, making the tool more robust and really validating the input and the output of the tool um, already at this, at this level. So models have been generated automatically. And then what the developer is expected to do is to go to this function that has been already created and um, fill them in with meaningful uh, code. Um, I can show you that the, the, the tool, this tab that has been generated can actually already be started. Um, so what I'm going to do next is install the, the dependencies of this tool and then start the tool. And then the, here you have the address of where you can go. And this tool also actually come up with a, a web client that you can use during development to, to interact with your tool. So you have to go to API UI. Um, so this is described in, in our specification if, if you read uh, it. And then, so this tool, so this is basically a web interface to the tool, to your tool. And here you can see that, for example, if I want to get information about this tool, the documentation tells you, show you example of um, here is what you, you can expect. But the nice thing is because the tool is actually running, we can make a, a, a query ourselves. And so right now I run the query, but because the tool doesn't know how to do anything, uh, it's going to return the string do magic to uh, all of these endpoints. Uh, so as I mentioned before, um, then the, the developer is expected to, to, to develop these four different functions. And then um, to show you an example, um, where can I find one? Yeah, so that's basically the, the next task. And then um, this, this tool that has been automatically generated also come even with a Docker file. So you can, you can build the tool as a Docker image, and then you can submit the, the Docker image to the NLP sandbox. So the NLP sandbox is hosted on Synapse, which is a, a collaboration platform developed by, by Sage Bio Network. Uh, and on Synapse, so you can create project. So for example, the NLP sandbox is, is created as a project, but so we, expo we expect developers to, to create their own private project, work with their team member, and each project come with a, a, a Docker registry where, where you can basically upload several Docker repositories. And so once you have pushed your Docker image, to your private repository. So you, you still totally keep control over your image. Your image is only accessible to you. And then you can submit it to a, to a challenge. So I usually need to be, to be signed in. Uh, here I cannot uh, do that. But um, basically you would select the submission queue um, available. And so you would select data notation and then uh, your, your tool will be basically sent with just a, a few clicks. And then you can, the, the developer can go to the, to the submission dashboard. So I don't think I've made a submission myself. So the, the table is going to be empty, but otherwise you would see a, a, a table that show whether your submission is queued or, or running. And once the submission is successfully evaluated, then it will be, the, its performance will be displayed on the, on the leaderboard table. And here you can see the information that we provide. So we provide information about the, the, the team, or the individual user who made the submission. We show the, the version of the NLP sandbox schema that was used. Here we report the score on the on two data sets right now, I2B2 and MCW. Um, soon we will add other colon for UDA, Mayo Clinic, and also potentially UCSF. And here you find information about the tool, like the name of the tool, the version that the developer have uh, set for their tool, as well as um, URL and a short description for the tool and also the license. So you can see under which license the tool is released. 
and then you can access uh, the doc. If, if the developer have made this image publicly available, then you can download it using this information. All right, so um, here are some of the features that we provide through the example that we give for each uh, task that the NLP Sandbox support. So the source code of this example is available on, on GitHub. Um, so in the case of a, of, a, of a Python example, this comes with a Docker file that has been improved uh, so that uh, actually we put in place a, a UWSGI server to make the application faster to, to run. But that aside, the most inter interesting thing I think for the developer is that the, the GitHub repository that we provide comes with GitHub workflows that each time that the developer do a change to his or her code, the entire project will be linted. So check that, the, the, that there is a, a good hygiene of the, of the code, for example, checking that lines are not too long. Um, unit and integration tests are also run, provided, and automatically executed. And when a developer creates a release of a, of a tool, then the tool is automatically built and pushed to Synapse. So that then the developer can go to Synapse, as I showed before, select um, the Docker image, and then submit it for evaluation. And we also have a workflow that periodically check if a new version of the NLP Sandbox schema is available. And if yes, a, a pull request will be automatically created that kickstarts the, the update of the tool. So one of the benefits of going towards tools that are API services instead of a command line program is that these tools are cloud friendly first, so they can be deployed on, on remotely on, on any server. And then this, in, this basically decouples the, the, the tool itself that performs the, the operations of interest and the, the, the client, if you want. So, with, a, with any NLP sandbox tools, um, so since they provide a an REST API, you can then use, for example, a Jupyter notebook or RStudio notebook to interact with this tool. For example, you can send a request that um, send a clinical note to the tool, and then you get back uh, annotations. Or you can write your own command line program that will send like batch of uh, queries to the tool. Or you can also build a web client uh, for example, using Angular or, or uh, React that send requests to, to this tool. And here are a few GitHub repositories that we provide. So one is a, a Python client library that you can use in your uh, project to interact not only with uh, the tools that are developed and, and developed by the, the community, but also the, the benchmarking components that we have, uh, such as a data node, which I'm going to introduce shortly. We also provide Dockerized R Studio Notebook. Uh, one of the nice things with R Notebook is that you can also use them to run Python code. So we are currently providing a very early version of this notebook that interact with um, this data node service that I just mentioned so that um, you can create and manage data sets in this data node. And we also provide a React uh, PHI identification, uh, the identification app, uh, application that I'm going to showcase in the second demo. So here you have the uh, more in detail, the benchmark infrastructure that we have developed. So we use Synapse to provide the documentation, submission queue, dashboard, leaderboard, as well as a space for developer to interact with the NLP Sandbox team, as well as with the rest of the community. So the developer submits their tool, and then we have multiple data sites that concurrently um, pull the submission and then run the submission against their own data. So here you have an example where you have two uh, organization uh, uh, located. Yeah, so here, for example, you have one that runs the benchmarking infrastructure in the cloud. For example, Mayo Clinic, who uh, plans to deploy the infrastructure in, in Google Cloud, or Mayo Clinic, or, or um, the example of, for example, MCW that is using on-premise server. So here in this infrastructure, so we have uh, a service that we call the NLP Sandbox controller. And this controller is responsible for listening to submission queue, pulling submission, 
and then deploying the, the submitted tool. And so the tool is then ready to receive uh, annotation request, for example. And then the, the controller is going to contact a service that we provide called the data node that contain the clinical notes as well as the gold standard information. So the controller retrieves the clinical notes, sends them to the, to the tool evaluated, for example, a, a data notator. The data notator returns the, the date prediction. Then the controller is storing the date prediction to the data uh, node so that later deeper analysis can be done on this prediction. But then the controller compares the prediction with the gold standard, computes the performance metrics, and the only piece of sensitive information that leaves this very secure environment is a one matrix, which is a performance, which is then published in the, in the leaderboard table. So we have several um, organ data partners that provide data sets, and we are actively working with other sites to, to onboard them. Right now, when a developer make a submission, uh, and especially a, a PHI annotation tool, the tool is going to be evaluated on the I2B2 uh, data set, so the, the evaluation data set from the I2B2 challenge, as well as the, the private data set from, from uh, MCW. So here you can see the, the number of nodes in each data set. In the case of MCW, they have uh, several thousands of nodes that are actually uh, already annotated, and we are uh, working in order to increase this number and, and uh, make them available to benchmark the performance of the tools. So I mentioned before, so one of the components of the, the benchmarking infrastructure that we have developed is called the, the data node. So this is basically an API service used to create and manage data sets, as well as a fire store where, so we are using the, the fire standard to describe patient information as, uh, as well as clinical notes. So once you have created a data set, you can then uh, create a Firestore where we push uh, typically the, our clinic, the clinical notes. And then in a data set, you can create one or more annotation store. So we typically create one annotation store where we store the gold standard. And then for each tool that we evaluate, we create another store where we can store the, the prediction. And then later it's possible to again, select prediction of interest and then conduct deeper ana analysis. So the users of this data node first are the, the data sites because it's an important component of the benchmarking infrastructure, but it can also be used by developers to test locally their tools. So they would deploy the, the data node on their computer, then fill it in with maybe public data and then streamline the, the evaluation of their tool, reading data from the data node and sending the data to the, to the tool and then getting back the response and saving it in, in the data node. And also NLP users who place, for example, here data node, uh, clinical nodes that they want to process. And then they can use this as a source of data uh, for the tools deployed in production environment. We also made it so that all the components that we developed for the NLP sandbox infrastructure are portable. And so you can use Docker to deploy, for example, these data nodes anywhere where your data lives, which, which lead to reducing or eliminating in ingress costs. So one of the properties of the tool that um, we wanted to, to enable is to make this tool reusable, not, not only you know, make them interesting for, well, actually it's a benchmarking, so it's open in time, but Ideally, this tool should be, we, we want this tool to become basically the building blocks or even more complex tool in order to accelerate the development of this more complex tool. Here, an example of a slightly more complex tool is a PHI identification that needs to perform several op operations, which are data annotation, person name annotation, and also being able to locate uh, location, ID, and, and contact. So in order to illustrate that, so we have developed an application called the NLP Sandbox PHI Identifier, which is available at, at this address. Um, so I'm just going to, to show it to you. So when you go to this application, 
So you're presented with a, a pop-up that tells you, well, first of all, don't send sensitive information to this tool. Uh, and, and just in general, don't send uh, sensitive information to services that your organization has not approved. And then we are saying that this tool actually depends on other tools that have been previously benchmarked. So here you can see that the tool is depending on the data annotator, like all this individual annotator I, I mentioned before. And then there is actually another tool of type PHI identification, which is responsible for, um, for, for delegating you know, part of the task to these individual uh, tools, get back the response, aggregate the response, and then return the, the results back to the user uh, through this, this web client. For example, you may have two annotators that say, maybe the data annotator is going to say, this string is a date. And then another annotator is going to say, no, it's, it's a person name. So then here it's up to the identifier to, to resolve this conflict. And hopefully this is something that we also plan to, to benchmark uh, in, in the short future. So here again, you can see the, the API version of the tool, who developed the tool, what is the, the license of the tool. And so for example here, so this is a React application developed by, by Conor. And so here you can input clinical notes. Here you can perform uh, several operations. You can decide what, uh, what type of sensitive information you want to annotate. For example, if it has been decided that it's not needed to, to annotate date, the, the, the tool like compute, compute time should not be spent doing this task. And this is really what we enable through this modular implementation. So here, if I just click on the identification, here you can see that the clinical note has been identified. Um, here you can see the type of annotation that has been detected, where the annotation is, is starting, for example, character three. Um, and then the, the confidence level. So this tool right now do not support confidence level. So they systematically return this, this value. And then you can, for example, change that to something else. Like for example, here, you, you, maybe you, you want to provide information about what type of information was there. And so here you can see that, for example, at this location, there was a person date. So one of the nice things is because all these tools are interoperable, then maybe uh, you know, two weeks from now, you may visit the leaderboard table of these different tools in order to identify whether a new a, a, a tool that performs better is available. And then you can just change the, the, the dependencies of your PHI identifier, restart it, and then the web application is going to use the, the new annotators. Um, so yeah, so here was uh, the demonstration and actually, So, so basically what we enable also something that we are aiming is that if you want on a single computer, you can deploy a data node, several tools um, that you are interested in, in running. And if you want, you can do that using a single Docker compose file and then de deploy all these services using a single uh, Docker compose command. And then as I mentioned, you, you and so, so here, for example, you can see that in this Docker Compose file, there are several services that are deployed. So one is a PHI annotator, which is a type of tool that actually implement all these individual annotation tools that I mentioned. But maybe you, you have found that actually there is a data annotator that could replace the data annotation function of your PHI annotator. So here you use, for example, your own organization PHI annotator, and then maybe you're going to use a, the data annotator from MIT. And then here is the data identifier, as I mentioned before, that delegate annotation to these two tools, as, as uh, mentioned here, depends on. And then uh, here you can, for each tool, for each task, you can specify to which tool you send basically the request. So in this case, for the data annotator, so we are sending it to the data annotator tool, but for all the other type of annotation, we are going to send them to the PHI annotator. And then here on the right, you can see a, a, a MongoDB instance, which is what we currently use for the, for the data node, as well as the data node service itself, which provides this, this interface uh, that you can then use to you know, uh, create data set and, and manage this data set. 
using either command line clients or, or notebooks or even web, web interfaces. So finally, um, why uh, de what, what developers should submit their, their tool to the NLP sandbox? So the first reason is escape the self-assessment trap. Um, I think in, in the recent year, it has become less and less acceptable for developers to select the data set on which they want to evaluate the performance of their tool, as well as select the, the performance metrics that they want to highlight. Here, um, basically, we provide an environment where if you want the community has agreed on specific metrics, several data sets also are made available. So it's really convenient for the developer to, um, to hear for this point too. It's very convenient to submit the tool once and then identify whether the performance of the tool generalize to multiple data sets. And, and thanks to the NLP sandbox, multiple uh, data sets that, that are private. Um, the NLP sandbox through the leaderboard tables enables the, the NLP developers to identify the tasks that are still, that have not been cracked yet and where there are still room of improvement. So this should lead developers to, to save time in order to not uh, reinvent the wheel. And all the tools that are submitted to the NLP sandbox will be made more visible, especially if they perform well, they will appear on the top of the, of the leaderboard table. Um, for, for the examples that we provide, so as we've seen with a, with a GitHub workflow, so we are really going towards uh, the development of fair tools that are robust. Um, the tool can then be used outside of the benchmarking and then be applied in, in production environment. And, and normally because, you know, through the, the API that we have defined and the, the constraint for the value of each uh, piece of information, everything like data are, are validated, both input and, and output. The tools are also dockerized, which makes them portable so that they can be easily deployed uh, anywhere where you, where you can run Docker. And finally, um, also, if, if you use any of the examples that we provide, then you are going to, to learn or maybe refresh some memories about uh, using modern software development technologies and models in order to develop tools. And we try to limit the tools that we provide as example to the smallest number of technology as possible. Um, so this technology being, we use GitHub to store our, our code, Docker to make the tool portable and open API to, to go towards these fair tools and make sure that they are, they are robust. Why join the organization as a partner uh, as, a, as a data partner. So as I mentioned earlier, is that if you deploy the benchmarking infrastructure that we provide, then all the tools that are submitted to a specific task will be evaluated on, 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 your, on this sample of your data. And then if you want to deploy a tool in production, you can then uh, make a more informed decision. You can also identify whether uh, for example, if, if a tool is submitted on several data sets and the, the performance of this tool is con uh, consistent on multiple data sets, but for one of these data sets, the performance drop, then um, this may provide a lead to, to further investigate. Maybe this is just due to, to different types of clinical note, or maybe the way the clinical note has been annotated is, is, is different and, and, and maybe could be improved. And also increase the visibility of your organization uh, in the NLP Sandbox community. Also, all the developers who are reporting in their publication performance metrics on your data set are going to list uh, the, the publication uh, that describe your data set. And also support the, the NLP Sandbox and just in general, the NLP community. Um, yeah, quickly, some, some activities we are working on uh, still this year. So one is opening this new task, COVID-19 symptom annotation. One is to enable tool to first train on private data uh, before being evaluated. Um, we are also actively on, uh, onboarding additional data sites, and we are also actively identifying new NLP tasks. But that's also something like the project is totally open to the community. And so we are welcoming any suggestion for, for a new task to, to benchmark. And with that, I would like to, to thank you. And, and now we can open the, I don't have much time, but we will definitely take the time to, to answer all the questions. Thank you.
for your muted Jashin. Thanks everyone so much for joining. We had two questions in the Q&A that were answered live. Um, the first one was just from Jungwei. In the new model to data approach, can participants also hide their model inner workings if they wanna protect their IP? And Tom responded, yes, Synapse provides private Docker registries and people can hide their inner model workings. Um, but as open science is one of our uh, sage values and project values, we encourage everyone in the NLP ecosystem to embrace this value as well. And then there is another question around how, you know, this doesn't appear trivial, like how do we bootstrap enough traction to get people to be a part of it? And Connor jumped in saying how a big motivator of this platform is to make more high quality data accessible to developers. So, um, you know, through that, we can encourage more uh, participation in this ecosystem. Um, those are the two questions we have so far. I know we're we're kind of running against time here. If you have anything else, please drop it in the Q and A, um, or I'll I'll share our emails as well in the chat so that you can reach out to us directly. Cool, let me just drop, I will drop my contact in the um, chat here. So if you have any questions, I can pass it over to the team. Um, and we definitely want to hear your feedback. We want, um, we'll be sending out a survey after to get a sense of, you know, what was helpful here and where can we provide more information um, to, to help empower you to be a part of NLP Sandbox. So. Um, do you want to be mindful of time? I know this is, uh, we're kind of up against the hour. So thank you so much to our webinar participants for joining. Um, keep an eye out for our post survey link and please reach out with any questions. Um, and on behalf, uh, on behalf of the NLP Sandbox team, su super, super thank you for um, joining our webinar. And I will, thanks Tom. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Jashin. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a good rest of your week.